We welcome you to worship today, and as we do so, we acknowledge that Calvary United Church stands on Treaty 6 territory. We pay our respects to our elders, both past and present, wherever we find ourselves this morning. We recommit to our status as an affirming ministry within the United Church of Canada and strive to be an open-minded, inclusive, and welcoming place of worship. It is our deepest hope that all people might feel at home in this space, and we give thanks to God for this Sabbath day where we join our hearts and minds in prayer. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this time of worship. And before we begin, I want to make a comment about the opening hymn. One of the joys of being only a part-time minister is that when it comes to picking hymns, I get to choose my favorite ones. (laughs) And you won't hear them again maybe till the next time I come. And this particular hymn, Wonderful Love, is actually the very first hymn that I can recall memorizing and knowing by heart as a teenager. So this has special memories for me, and and I share those with you because I know for me, and probably for many of you, music and the words that we set to music are what stay with us. Long after the sermon is gone and the prayers are gone, we still remember the words of the hymns Like, I remember this one. I can close my eyes and sing it in my sleep. Luckily, no one is there to hear me sing it in my sleep. And so we approach in faith this morning. Let us rejoice in the presence of our God. May we continue this faith journey through Lent to Good Friday and Easter Sunday, celebrating our faith in Jesus the Christ. Together then, within this faith community, and in the bond we share with other faith communities, we will reflect and learn.
Holy One, we get so used to our ways that we forget that we are called to grow and thus also to expand our awareness of our faith. We cling to that which we know, finding comfort in the familiar routines of our daily lives. Forgive us for the times when we are close-minded and or close-hearted. Forgive us when we refuse to hear your words of life, love, and opportunities for growth. Open us to your wisdom that we would choose to go wherever you lead us. Know this. God understands everything about us, and still we are loved, and within that love we are forgiven beyond any measure we could impose upon ourselves. We are God's beloved people. We rejoice and we are glad. And so we echo the words of a prayer that has been within the Christian community for nigh on 2,000 years, saying together in whatever wording is most comfortable for us, our Creator, our Christ, our Spirit, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. My name is Ruth Griffiths. At the uh, Calvary Annual Meeting last Sunday, someone asked for a report on the Mission and Service Fund, specifically missionaries. So here I am to give you a report. Our Mission and Service, or MNS as we often call it, our givings are used to support the administration, they used to be used to support the administration of the church as well as outreach programs. But since the reorganization of the church structure, the administration of the national church is now paid for from members through an annual assessment. Our 2023 budget that we just passed showed that Calvary will be expected to pay $1,100 in dues to the national church. Mission and service donations, however, are now a flow-through item on our uh, financial statement. That means whatever we donate here at the local church goes directly to the national church. The Mission and Service Fund, what does it do? And what does it support? Last year, the United Church of Canada gave $25 million to people in need. Through m &S, we share our resources with three goals in mind, to help transform lives, to inspire meaning and purpose, to build a better world. Closer to home, for example, the LaRange United Church uh, receives a mission support grant each year so that it can keep its doors open. And our beloved Camp Tapawingo usually receives a mission support grant as well, and that comes from m and Givings. But I was asked to find out how many missionaries we support. You probably know that missionaries are now called overseas personnel. The word missionary carries the baggage of an era when we had a top-down approach to our outreach in the church. In past decades, the church has moved to a partnership style. It is my understanding that the United Church of Canada only sends personnel to work on projects when it has been invited to do so. The 2021 annual report of the United Church of Canada shows 13 overseas personnel working with partner organizations in Japan, Korea, El Salvador, Jamaica, Morocco, Morocco, and Colombia. We had two people 
at the UN Conference on Climate Change called COP26 in Scotland. And we had students at seminaries in Cuba and the Philippines. Mission and service is generosity in action. I invite you now to greet one another with the peace of Christ. Peace be with you. The first reading for today is from Genesis 12, verses 1 to 4. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. The second reading is from Romans 4, verses 1 through 17. What then are we to say was gained by Abraham our ancestor according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but something due. But to one who does not work, but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. So also David pronounces a blessing on those to whom God reckons righteousness, apart from works. Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one against whom the Lord will not reckon sin. In this blessing, then, pronounced only on the circumcised or also on the uncircumcised, we say, faith was reckoned to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it reckoned to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the ancestor of all who believe without being circumcised and who thus have righteousness reckoned to them. And likewise, the ancestor of the circumcised who are not only circumcised but follow the example of the faith that our ancestor Abraham had before he was circumcised. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For it is the adherents of the law who are to be their heirs. Faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there transgression. For this reason, the promise depends on faith in order that it may rest on grace, so that it may be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, who is the father of all of us, as it is written. 
I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. The third reading is from John 3, verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with that person. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you do not hear the sound of it, but you do know where it comes you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lift up, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to contemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Hear what the scriptures are saying to the church. Thanks be to God.
May the thoughts that I share with you this morning and the ways in which we integrate those thoughts into our daily lives be our shared gift to you, our Creator Christ Spirit. Amen. So since we are in the season of Lent, I thought it might be helpful to do a little bit of research on where the seasons that we have in the United Church actually come from. Who decided that there should be seasons in the liturgical year? And how long ago was this decided? So I did some research on uh, YouTube. And uh, lo and behold, there was a council in Nicaea, which is now part of Turkey, way back in the year 325, so soon 1,700 years ago. And this Council of Nicaea was actually formed to deal with a very important theological issue. The question that the council was confronting was this. Is Jesus born of God and the Spirit, or is Jesus born of God through the Spirit? And as I'm reading this, all I can think to myself is only a group of church people could ever invest so much time and effort into such a question. It is somehow the definitive of who we are as a church. What is not definitive of who we are as a church is what happened to the members of the losing side of that debate. They were executed. And that is our history. That same council decided on the seasons of the liturgical year, the church year seasons. Advent because we always begin with Advent, even though that's not the beginning of the regular year. The liturgical year begins with Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Easter, and Pentecost. And Pentecost runs from whenever the Sunday of Pentecost is until Advent again. So we have the Council of Nicaea, to thank for the liturgical seasons. We no longer discuss the question that was of such importance to the Council of Nicaea. It seems to me and to most theologians today to be somewhat not to the point. Jesus is who Jesus is, and that seems to be sufficient for all of us. The other thing about the Council of Nicaea that is somewhat significant for us living in, quote unquote, the new world, is that the Council of Nicaea made some decisions about what should happen in the world where there were not Christians yet. And you know where I'm going with this that the Council of Nicaea decided that it was the job of the church leaders to Christianize the whole world. And here we are, 1,700 years almost later, still wrestling with what it means to be Christian, still wrestling with what it means to be followers of Jesus the Christ, the child of God, and still wrestling with what it is that God asks of us. And we use scripture readings as sort of our guideline for some of the questions that we have. And so we have that wonderful reading from Genesis where Abraham is told by God to leave his country and go over into a new land that God will show him. 
and God will make Abraham the father of many nations. Now, I used to read that years and years ago in my younger age as something glorious. How wonderful this is that Abraham was beginning to spread his faithfulness to other places. And then I started to think about what Christians have done in the world since Jesus' crucifixion. Recognizing, of course, that Abraham is pre-Christian, Jewish, of the tribe of Judea. But recognizing what Christians since the crucifixion have done by following this edict that they believe God has given them to go out into the world and make Christians of everyone else. And there isn't in brackets, but there ought to be, whether they want to or not. And I started to reflect on this idea of God saying to Abraham, I want you to leave your homeland and go over to this other land. Where there are already people living who know nothing about Abraham and Abraham's religion and God and who probably have lived quite well in that land without Abraham coming to tell them what they should believe. And then I sat up a little bit straighter and thought about what Christians have done. The Council of Nicaea said to go out into the world and make Christians of all nations. And I remember sitting in history classes in public school and reading about Christopher Columbus and Sir Francis Drake and Magellan, all of these explorers from the European side of the Atlantic Ocean, making their way to a new world and discovering it. And I know that as a child I was somewhat naive I did think what a wonderful thing that all these explorers went out there and discovered this new land that we call now North America and South America. And never really paying any attention to the fact that there were already people in this new land who had discovered it long before the discoverers from Europe discovered it. And what right did these people from Europe have to force the people who were here to believe what they believed? Is this really what God asks of us? To force our faith on others? And I know that this is a conversation that we now have had for several decades. Our relationship with the First Nations people in, in our community and in our country and in our world. What have we done as Christians in terms of the world we now inhabit? What have we done to the people that we say are less than we are? Because that's the attitude that the explorers carried with them into new lands. The people that they found were savages, and they used that word. The people they found were heathens because they were clearly not Christian. Did any of those explorers for one moment wonder whether the God that they believed in was also the God that these people believed in?
How accountable are you and I for what was done by our ancestors? I don't have answers. I am grateful that I have reached an age where I dare to ask the questions that I should have been asking when I was learning these things in school. But of course, there was no opportunity in school really to ask those questions. But I ask those questions now. When we read our Bible, particularly when we read a story that says to a character in the Bible, I want you to leave your familiar land and go to another land and take it over. What are we thinking when we read that? Are we really thinking that this is God speaking to Abraham? Or are we wondering... Is Abraham looking at a land that maybe has more wheat opportunities than the land he lives in? Maybe more room for his family to grow? Who is speaking to us in what we read in Scripture? We do believe that Scripture is the Word of God. But do we also agree that we might misinterpret God's Word? Indeed, have misinterpreted century after century after century. And have we reached an age now in our faith journey where we are willing to live with questions? rather than being sure of the answers. In my theological journal, there is no room for a God who says, take over another country and make them believe in me. In my vision of God, there is a sense in which people can see God through how I behave to others. The way that I carry myself in my community is a way of people to understand how I understand God. And I think that remains our challenge as children of God. to reflect a loving faithfulness that embraces community, that shares the riches we have with others, that is willing to point out things that are wrong and seek ways to right them. And most of all, a community that is able to say, a place for everyone at our table. And yes, I think we in the United Church are moving very much in that direction. And I am grateful to be part of this United Church of ours. But I think the moving in that direction is also the challenge to us. How do we see God and how do we interpret God's love to those around us? It isn't by taking over a land and saying you must be Christian. It is by living faithfully within yourselves so that by your lives, others might see God reflected in it. We have a lot of work to do yet in reconciliation, in understanding cultures that are different from the one with which we are familiar. But with God's love and our faithfulness, we can do this journey together. Thanks be to God. Amen.
And so we pray. Gentle, gracious, loving healer, we reflect on the gift of your healing love for our world. And we offer you our thanksgiving from hearts filled with love, joy, and hope as we make our way through each day of our lives. We pray for those who have gone before us, especially those who have been part of faith communities that have closed and have come together in this special place. May we who share so many different backgrounds, but who offer hymns of praise and a spirit of unity, continue to embrace the wider community with our loving actions. On this second Sunday in Lent, we pray for faithful people throughout the world who read the same scriptures we have read and who share a vision similar to ours, that the world would truly be a healthy place if we but recognize the broken places in our world and brought healing love to all creation. And so it is that we offer a prayer for those who find themselves in positions of leadership throughout the world. May they, like Abraham and Jesus, make a difference to those who follow them. May they recognize the blessing they could be for others if they lead with love and integrity rather than envy and greed. We pray for those in our community who experience the pain of poverty with all of its attendant handicaps. May we as a faith community continue to be part of the solution with our Care and Share project and with the Mission and Service Fund, which provides resources for those with limited access to the advantages we take for granted. We pray as generations before us have prayed. In the shadow of Abraham, our common ancestor, and in the love of Jesus the Christ, who is your gift, O oh God, to our world, and who challenges us to be our gift to others. In love, in faith, and in trust, we offer our prayers to you. Amen. Our journey through this Lenten season may take us into the corners of our own lives. But we do not walk alone. Christ walks with us, reassuring us along the way that to walk through the shadow of the cross also means to walk in the light that shines behind the cross, God's light, reminding us of the Creator's ever-present gift of hope. May the blessing of our Creator Christ Spirit, our companion on this Lenten journey, be with us all. And all God's children say, Amen, Amen, Amen. Amen.